Uh, turn with me to John 16. We will finish this text this morning by taking a look at what Jesus proclaims at the latter portion of this text. John 16. Let's look at verse 29 through the end, and we'll read it together. And his disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I don't know how long... Any of you have ever had certain hobbies or interests that you've invested in? But some of us have learned to enjoy certain things, and we sort of do them for a short while, and we go, eh, we're moving right along. But there are some things in our lives we just invest in forever. For me, martial arts, chess, music, things like that. And there are some things that you do, for example, like instruments or fighting. And when I say fighting, I, mean, I don't mean violence. I mean the fighting arts. And any other type of training, maybe your job, where you train and you train and you train and you train. And then after a while, your training is what guides you. That which you've practiced for so long takes you to the end. And when you think you can't remember what to do or how you would respond, all of a sudden, the training takes over, and you do that which you were trained to do. And that works in defense. It works in first responders' lives. It works with the medical profession. It works with the widget makers and the widget coders and everything else. And everywhere you look, the discipline and the training helps guide you to the success of maintaining whatever it is that you've been called to maintain or to accomplish. And it's not different in a spiritual sense. However, it is different in a spiritual sense. Because I've been teaching the Bible for a long time. A long time. And a lot of times people would see that and go, okay, so you've been in the ministry fully for 21 plus years and you've been teaching longer than that. You've done evangelism even in your youth. So you're the expert because you have so much experience. You ever felt that way about somebody? You have so much training. Well, I won't say anything deprecating to any of my fellow friends who are well trained, but even the best of training leaves us wanting sometimes. The Bible teaches us to be trained in it. The Bible itself is that which trains God's people in itself. But it is not about us or our intelligence or our abilities. It's not about our longevity in the faith or our experience or expertise or the number of initials that I could add to the end of my name, which are absurd that makes us qualified or successful. This isn't new. Paul teaches Timothy. And he says that all Scripture is breathed out by God and is useful. For what? Correction, rebuke, instruction, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be successful in all of his work. So, if that's true for the teaching, the preparation of the church, then it is equally true for the church, each and every one of us, individually and collectively, to be trained in the righteousness of God 
which in that context means the learning of the person of Christ and what he accomplished. That we might also teach and train others. And what am I getting at? We all agree with that. All of us. Amen, amen, exponentially amen. We all agree with all of that. However, sometimes we agree with it so much that we fall back into our training. We fall back into our way of thinking from a secular point of view that I don't, I don't have enough time in the Bible to, to understand it. Or I don't have enough years of experience rightly understanding the truth in order to share it. Or I, I can't obviously know what the Bible's saying, so I better ask the pastor. There's nothing wrong with that. But we see what we do is we put too much credit on training rather than give the credit to God. We've seen Jesus already in the last few months of this teaching say, they shall all be taught by God. We've seen Jesus say in John 6 and in John 3 and then in other places in John 10 that only the sheep will hear His voice. Only those that the Father has given to Him will come to Him. And all that were given to Him will come and He will give them the promise of eternal life. He will raise them up. This isn't a possibility, it isn't a probability, it isn't an offer. It's a guarantee. We sang about that this morning in the first two hymns we sang. The guarantee, the man of God's own choosing, Jesus the Christ. And with one little word, Jesus has failed the enemy. He's, it's done. That's what Jesus proclaims here. I have overcome the world. Think about that for a second. Sometimes it is so common for us in our flesh to put hope in how we even grow in grace as our hope. Now what's that mean? Sometimes it's easy for us to think that, well, if I don't do it, God can't do it. If I'm not disciplined, God won't work. It's the furthest from the truth. If you cannot pray, God will pray for you. If you cannot see, God will open your eyes. If you cannot stand, God will lift your arms. If you cannot live, Christ will be your life. But when we hear that, in our culture especially, where there's a will, there's a way. The American dream. Take it by the horns and slam that bull to the ground. You can do it. I mean, how many... Other quips and quotes do we need to show that we live in the secularist society that calls itself Christian but has no Christ in it? That training sometimes takes over. Sometimes that thinking takes over. Sometimes that ideal and mindset and worldview takes over and we find ourselves in an incredible dichotomy. Where is our God, we say. Everybody has abandoned me. Everything has fallen apart. The world has come to an end. Last week, Brother Jesse preached out of 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. And the instruction there, as he so passionately taught us, is to, for the glory of God, take the pejorative label as Christ follower and honor God in it. You may not know what that means. That the word Christian, Christ follower, was a negative term to mock and make fun of those who were believers. Antioch, King Agrippa, he coined the phrase. And Paul is saying, take that label not as a curse, but glory, glorify God in it. Glorify, glorify God in it. But yet if we take our Americanized spiritual training and we put it in front of us, we take it, we put it on like glasses and we look at everything through that lens, we're going to hear Peter and Jesus and others say to us, you better get your life together 
And you better do what's good and you better do what's right so that God will bless you. So that God will save you. So that something good can come out of it. But Jesus teaches something exactly opposite, doesn't he? We've gone through verse 29 through 32 already. We've already taught that over the last few weeks. John 16, 29 through 33. We'll be spending most of our time extrapolating Jesus' statement. But for now, let's just get our minds back in gear. I'm leaving. I'm not going to speak to you. This is Jesus. I'm not going to speak to you anymore in figures of speech, but I'm going to clearly reveal the Father to you. I'm going to show exactly who I am and what I came to accomplish. You will have no more questions. Now, we know what that means, right? His death, burial, and resurrection. All the teaching that didn't make sense will now finally make sense for the disciples. And it's not even their discipline that's going to make it fruitful. It's God the Holy Spirit that's going to make it fruitful. It is God the Spirit who will make their lives fruitful for the cause of the good news of Jesus Christ, the redemption that is theirs in Him, the life that is promised to them through Him. They, as we saw last Sunday or the Sunday before, were complete failures in their understanding of the gospel. They saw it, they go, oh, we see now, you're t okay, we understand. We know that you are from God. We don't have to inquire anymore. We don't have to ask anymore. No one has to ask anymore. And Jesus answers in verse 31, oh, do you now believe? That is, a, that is a, an, in a sense of, I don't know, a, a word to, to put there. To me, in context, it's like Jesus is saying to them, oh, yeah, right. Now you believe? Now all of a sudden you just, ta-da, you don't. And he reiterates that in context by this next statement. Behold, the hour is coming, and indeed it has come when you will be scattered. Now is scattering around and away from the Christ, is scattering, is running from Jesus, saving faith. To the culture who says discipline and training is what proves your hope. No. But to the gospel, our hope is not in our staying. Our hope is in the one who abides with us, Jesus Christ, who purchased us and paid for us. So as our lives ebb and flow, as our lives are mature and weak, as our faith is strong and non-existent sometimes, I'm not saying that we just... Que sera, sera. It doesn't matter. God's going to work it out. That's a true statement. But for the believing ones, we have a true and certain resolve and assurance that though it wanes, never leaves. But the training of the religious culture in which we live puts in assurance that has no hope. Puts it in our solidarity. It puts it in our faith, it puts it in our work, it puts it in our morals, it puts it in our church attendance, it puts it in all sorts of things. I mean, I'm still working through, someone asked this question on Wednesday for, this, for next week's Theology on Call, you know, is there any room for tradition in the true evangelical church? And that's, you know, 30 minute answer if I spent time dealing with it. And the true answer is, not really. Doesn't hurt to sing songs, doesn't hurt to have a lectern, doesn't hurt to sit out there and I stand here just for simplicity's sake, but it's not necessary. I could stand down there. I could stand in the middle chair and you could all turn around and watch. I could stand behind the curtain, you could just listen. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. I mean, you know. But yet we, we hold to those things sometimes as our our comfort in the midst of struggle, rather than into Christ. And so even when the believer doubts and has times of hopelessness, their hope is always risked, reassured, not because of what we do, not because of the resolve we make, but because of the finished work of Christ that He accomplished. And it's a spiritual thing. By the word of God, we see and know that the Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are His 
children, you see. I've even been wondering, how do I get out of us the mindset that we go to church? The word church in itself is just an incredibly poor word. It's a pathetic word. It means kirk. It's a transliteration of a word that means organization. The word church means organization. It would fit IBM as better than it fits us. And that's why in our day when people say, where do you go to church? They give you the address. What's a better word? Gathering is a better word. We are the people of God saved by the blood of Christ gathering in this building that just three years ago was a wig shop. And a not so clean one at that. It's a wig shop. We don't go to church we are the body of Christ and we gather together out of necessity. See, there's a necessity here. This is so not worth our time if it's to be entertaining because this is not entertaining. It's so to be not, it's not worth our time if it's just to be myopic and introspective in such a way that we don't care about anything else or anybody else around us. It doesn't work that way. There's nothing beneficial for us there. We're the body. And I don't know about you, but if I wake up tomorrow morning and my legs are missing, I'm going to be freaked out. I was having a conversation last night about the failing of my eyesight. I mean, I'm just, I'm fighting this battle. This is a real battle for me, y'all. I use my eyes all the time. I know most of you don't. And some of you just sort of walk around with them closed half the day. But I use my eyes as long as I'm awake, which is a lot. Sometimes 19, 20 hours a day. And when you're talking about that, I mean, I'm thinking, if I woke up tomorrow not able to see out of one of them, it's going to be a problem. And I go, oh, well, I guess my eye took off for the day. And my right leg, that's going to be real funny. My left eye, my right leg, I'm just going to hop around in a circle. It's okay, though. Let me make my coffee. Boom, fall, spill, trip down the stairs. I mean, can you imagine? Make a good YouTube channel. Probably make a million dollars. The one-eyed, one-armed man falling down the stairs. And you see it over and over again. Then they make memes out of it. And I digress. But I'm not going to say it's okay. I'm going to be freaked out. I'm going to have a problem. There's going to be somebody to have to give an explanation as to what happened to my body parts. Where are they? And if they have their cell, I'm going to call my legs up and say, yo, dog, where are you? And they're not answering my text. I'm going to freak out. I'm going to call the cops. Have you seen any legs on the side of the road? Has there been any accidents on the freeway with some legs? Mine never came home last night. You get the point. We should have the same tenacity about our intimacy as God's people as we would if our legs were missing. Because we are the body of Christ. And when we're all together, we're functioning well. You know what? We're not functioning well this morning. We are not functioning as a body this morning. I would say that half of our brain is probably gone. <laughs> I would say that one of our legs is missing. One of our eyes is missing. One of our hands is missing. And a whole bunch of toenails. <laughs> For those of you who remember me talking about bags of toenails some years ago. Why? Why would you say that? Because we're not all together. We have some of us who are sick who cannot be here and we long for them. We want to be with them. We want to help them. They have ministry to give to us as well. So, what's the point there? The point is, is that see how the training of culture has dictated who we are and how we operate just in a word? I'm going to church. I went to church. Yeehaw, I'm done with church. Let's eat. I love church. Let's go back next week. And it's just silly. Because it's completely unbiblical. It's not like wicked evil. It's just the training we've been taught. And that's easy. Living life like that as, as a body, as a false body in a false box, as an organization, is simple. A monkey can do it. Any animal 
can create an organization and make it function. You ever been to a zoo? Works all the time. You go to the zoo, there's all the animals, you stick them in a cage, people pay money, go, look, there's an animal, there's an animal, there's no animal, there's no animal. And then it's, you go home, $15 hot dog, it's a day at the park. Organization. You aren't an animal, you aren't in the jungle, you aren't part of a lion pride. You just walked around and looked at them. That's sort of how most people deal with being a Christian in our culture. They walk around and look at each other like, oh, look at the tigers today. They were in rare form. They were actually kind. They weren't chasing the mice. They didn't chase the rabbits. How do we get that out? I don't know. As a pastor, I've been working on that for over a decade. How do I get that out of my own brain? But training takes over. So where's my hope? My hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. My hope is that He is the victor over even that silly stuff. These people... These 11 disciples of Jesus at this last supper said to him, Oh, now we believe and see clearly. And Jesus says, you're about to run for your lives. Is that the, is that the totality of your faith in me? Is that what it means to believe? Is that when somebody comes along and says, Hey, you were with Jesus. You're going to go, not me. Jesus who? It wasn't me. Aren't you Paul? No, 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 I'm Bob. I mean, Paul did that, I mean, um, Peter did that three times. Aren't you Peter? No, I'm Bob. Call me Pebble. Three times, and now he's telling the rest of them, the other ten, you're going to scatter. Only one disciple went to the cross, and it was the author of this gospel. It was the author of this gospel. And many years ago, I put myself sitting at my desk reading this text, reading the Gospel of John. And I put myself in the face, if I could, in my mind's eye as John, watching my Savior die. Being at the cross, seeing my Creator bleed. And understanding just what an intimate relationship He had with the Savior. He's the only one. Was it because John was so passionate? Was it because John was so disciplined? Was it because of John? No, John was counted in this number. He went to the cross because it was ordained by God for him to be there. That he might have more to say concerning the love of God for him than any other apostle that ever lived. You'll be scattered, each to his own home, and you will leave me alone. We've dealt with that. We don't have to revisit it now. Listen to these words now. Yet I am not alone. I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. Now, does that come home for you? I should have maybe read all of chapter 14, 15, 16, but then we would have had about 20 minutes to preach it. But it, it should just come alive for you. It should be there for you. Jesus, throughout this whole gospel, has talked about, I come from the Father. I come down from heaven. I am the bread of life that comes down from heaven. Your ancestors, this is John 6, your ancestors ate the bread in the wilderness and they died. But I am the bread that gives eternal life. Moses gave our fathers the bread. No, God gave you the father, your fathers the bread, and they died, and Moses died. He's a dead husband, has no hold anymore. He's through. But yet the culture of Jesus' day was a group of religious zealots called the Pharisees who ruled and managed worship who ruled and managed the teaching of the Bible, who ruled and managed the prayers and the sacrifices that they couldn't even accomplish the way that they were supposed to be because they were under Roman occupation. They could not even have court. The Sanhedrin could not even go into certain areas of the temple for judicial hearings because the sword belonged to Rome. This is why Jesus was crucified, not stoned. 
And yet the whole of the world saw those who were close to God, those who knew God the Father as the Pharisees. The Pharisees came about during the Maccabean revolt. Where? In the occupation of Israel, they sacrificed a pig in the temple. And these zealous Jews said, enough is enough. And they fought against their enemy. And God granted them success. And because so much of Judaism had been Hellenized, had become more culturally indistinctive from the culture around them, a group of people known as the Pharisees came about. And they were the reformers of Israel. And now... They were the anathema of Israel. And Jesus is telling his own people that the Father is with him. He is not alone. Imagine this reality and what it causes in the hearts of its hearers. What does it say in your heart when everything you knew as solid and true and real you're told that it's about to come undone. When every solid foundation that you've ever had in life, that you've always known would be there, suddenly vanishes. When you wake up without legs, and you have no idea how. How are you going to get out of the bed? How are you going to go about your day? Is that something that brings peace No. Just the thought of it's horrifying. It's been the stick of most evangelists throughout our lifetime. From the mid 1900s, or from the mid 19th century, 1800s to present day, it's the modern stick of evangelism where let me scare the audience into seeing the reality of death and its subsequent judgment. And that in that fear, in that elevated blood pressure, in that sinus rhythm increase, I can put a hook and catch them for Jesus. Sounds sort of sinister when I say it like that, because it is sinister. There's no bad news that gives us peace, is there? And so what we want desperately, if I I said to you, If I go to the doctor tomorrow and I hear, James, you're going to die of cancer in six months. I mean, as much as God will give me peace in the midst of all of that, I will not have peace in that moment. As a matter of fact, it's very likely I die of a heart attack at the hearing of that news. Because I've nearly died of a heart attack in the hearing of news of others that I've lost. Because of how it feels. I couldn't imagine being told it was me. And so at that moment, in that time, when we think that everything that we thought was going to secure us is no longer there, all we want is to resolve that conflict, that problem. We want peace. But hearing the words do not bring peace. That's why I find this extremely important, church. Behold, the hour is coming. You say you believe now. You're going to leave me alone and abandon me. But I will not be alone, for the Father is with me. And I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. Doesn't that seem counterintuitive? Two things to think about here. One, Jesus is showing... That there is nothing in the world. He's already said it. He's just repeating it right here. But he's showing there is nothing in the world. And I'll define the world for you in just a moment. That will ever, ever, ever give you peace. It's not a new relationship. It's not a new job. It's not a new city. It's not a new opportunity. It's not a new organization. It's not a new nothing. It's not a raise. It's not a good bill of health. None of it will give you peace because it's just like a new car. 
Just as a show of hands, how many of you have ever bought a new or newer car? How long is it the new car? As long as it smells that way. I'm being honest. As long as it has that tight, crisp, oh my gosh, that's carcinogenic, but I love it, smell. Because you know it's killing us. But we love it. That's a new car. When the smell goes away, or the first ding, or the first spill, the first time the coffee cup flips over in the floorboard, first chip on the window, and we don't love it anymore at all. I need to trade this thing in. I've only had it three weeks, but it's old. A new car. That's what the worldly peace is. That's what temporary resolve of this internal conflict is. It's just a new car that's the old car that you can't wait to get rid of years later. It's just a new toy at a holiday or a birthday or a Christmas time that a child gets and can't stand it, been wanting it all year long, gets it. By March, it's worthless. I want this. Back in the days of catalogs, we had that wish book. Remember that? As a kid, we'd fight over that thing. They sent it in the mail, I don't know, what, June? The pre-wish wish book, and then the wish book, and then the mega wish book, and it was just full of toys. And by the time November came around, you couldn't even read what was in there. It was, everything, was, everything was circled. 700 pages, all of it circled. I want this, I want this, I want this. Just call them up Sears and say, I don't want these four items. Send the rest. That's, that's, that's basically what it was. I guarantee you that if Christmas morning they'd had a brand new wish book, we wouldn't even have opened our toys. Oh, well, we got this junk over here. Let's circle some stuff now. Because the feeling of peace that comes from the world is fleeting, and it is never going to happen. It is never going to bring us a fullness and a satisfaction. It never will. And this is not even talking about persecution. This is not even what Jesus is dealing with in context. This is just the nature of the heart of humanity. This is what's real and alive in us this very moment. And this is what's real and alive in me right now. And if it isn't stuff from a magazine, it's opportunity. If it's in an opportunity, it's resolve. I want resolve. I should have been in a beauty pageant. What do you want? World peace. I want world peace. But God will not give it. There's no such thing. It's actually oxymoronic according to what Jesus teaches. World and peace are like non-compatible. The world will never have peace. Ever. We're just on the precipice of another war. Which one? I don't know. But I promise you it's coming. And if it's not a war of world wide flavor, it'll be a war of somebody. There's wars going on right now. There's rumors of wars. It will always be the case. And then suddenly... And passionately and powerfully. We no longer look at the world. What does John say in his first epistle? 1 John 2, 15, 16, 17. Do not love the world. Do not love the things of the world. Do not love the things in the world. For the things of the world are not of God. They are not of God. But they are passing away. What are they? The pride of life. The pride of possessions. Pride of power, the lust of the eyes. What's the lust of the eyes? That's really, I'd like to have that. Do I need that? Nope, but I really like to have that. I'd really like to be that. I'd really like to look like that. I'd really like to go there. That's nice. Lust of the eyes. And is there anything wrong with buying a new shirt or new pairs of shoes? Could be, could not be. Buy them, it doesn't matter. But if we think that happiness is what, it, is what life is all about, how long does it last? Not long. It's not true, it's not real. It's a magic trick, it's an illusion. Magic isn't real, it's all trickery. It's smokes and mirrors. The enemy, as he tempted Jesus in the wilderness, took him up, on a cliff to look out over the kingdom. And he said, look at all that you can see. As far as your eye can see, I own this. Now how 
delusional was the enemy. But that's how he viewed himself. He was this powerful metaphysical being in the spiritual realm. And he felt like because he'd been thrown to the earth, that the earth was his. The prince of the power of the air. But yet, what happens? He says, if you just bow down to me, O son of man, son of God, Jesus the Christ, I will give it all to you. And Jesus commands him to leave. And he leaves. The foolishness of humanity is often seen very clearly in the fact that even when we know that the benefit and the joy is fleeting, we, we're willing to take temporal joy over eternal peace. And the temporal joy of the disciples in this conversation was, well, at least the Father's with us. In our minds, we know that. And some of them, even Peter, would say, I'm not going anywhere. Thomas had already said, we're going to die with him. I'm laying my life down for Jesus. Thomas wouldn't even come back to the upper room after the resurrection. The Father is with me. And I've said these things that in me you may have peace. You see, Jesus is showing us, this is the two things I was trying to say, that the world will never give peace. It's only in Him. It's not in our discipline. It's not in our focus. It's not in, our, it's not in us at all. It's never in us. It's always in Him. It's never in our training. It's always in Him. It's never in our academic knowledge. It's always in Him. And this is the work of God. My peace I give to you. My love I give to you. My joy I give to you. If we were to back up a few chapters of where Pastor Jesse preached last week, in chapter 1 of 1 Peter, it says that that joy is often inexpressible. And now Jesus says something extremely important. Just in case we or his hearers didn't get the point that Christ alone is our peace and everything else in the world is not, he makes it clear. In the world, you will have tribulation. You will suffer. You will have pain. Jesus has never promised his beloved people that they will have an easy life. Do you know that? The heretics and the damnable false gospels of our culture will tell you that all the time. Jesus is going to give you a nice life. Jesus, if you've got enough faith, to give you a nice pocketbook. Jesus will give you an easy way. The Bible contradicts that 100%. Name me one person in the Old or New Testament that had an easy life and barbecued on the weekends and did slideshows at the end of their day. Look how awesome my life was. You don't want to see a slideshow of my life. Y'all know what slideshows are, right? Yeah. If you grew up in a missionary family, you know what a slideshow is. Like, oh, my goodness. How many are there? Six trays. I'm done. I mean, you know. And this is the entrance to the park. <laughs> yeah. This is the dirt road going to the place we did the work into the park. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I just lost myself for a minute. It's torture. <laughs> Sorry for those of you who haven't read the I love you all in your mission work, but I do not like your slideshows. I mean, you don't want to see a slideshow in my life. It would be depressing. I mean, I could show you the quick flip book of the awesome times, but there would be a fake representation of my life. Like, I could show you the fun moments I had at a theme park or the joy on our face as each of our children were finally born. But not the hours of agony beforehand. In the years of up and down pain and suffering since then. <laughs> the depressive thoughts, the frustration, the, the morning sickness, the motion sickness, the, the, the food poisoning. The bad reports. Death, destruction, divorce. 
disease. I mean, look at it. I mean, is it, we really want to show that? Is that? Is that? Look how good the Lord is. Yep, that's where I broke my leg. That's where I woke up and one of them were gone. And this is where, you know. Oh, wow, that's so entertaining. It's not joy. The world is not going to give us that. Christ is our joy. He is not of the world. He created it. And we who are in Him are not of the world, though we are in it. Now, what is the world? See, people think the world is just the planet. Well, it could be, but not in the context of John's writing. The world is looked at in one of two ways. And how do we know what something means? Context. Context. You should look at your British counterparts who speak the English language on how they say certain words that we use differently. As a matter of fact, if we use some of the words we use commonly in their culture, we are actually using profanity. If I cut my hand and it gets blood all over my arm, it's a bloody arm. Well, over there, that's profane to a sin. Doesn't mean the same thing. What's a cookie? What's a biscuit? <laughs> we know what the difference are. They don't. Context. What is the world? The world in this context of John, which is why I read John 1, the first 18 verses in the beginning of our service. John 1 talks about that he came into the world. The world did not know him. In John 3, God loved the world in this way that He gave His only Son, the only one that He had, that those believing ones would not perish but have eternal life, but the non-believing ones are condemned already, for they are not believing in the only Son that He has sent, the only one that He has. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, but the world loved the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. Let me tell you something. There are two aspects of the world that John utilizes in every usage, and it is this. It is the totality of sinful humanity. And more specifically, it is inclusive and identified by zealous religiosity. So just as all the world in its paganism is evil and wicked and sinful, so are the Jews in their religion are just like them. That is it. And when Nicodemus, who was the teacher of all of Israel, who understood the law and who understood Moses and who understood the prophecy of God through the prophets of concerning Meshach, Messiah, the Christ... When Jesus said, your confession of who I am and where I come from is insufficient for your eternal life. You must be born again by God the Spirit. Then Jesus tells him that the world of which Nicodemus at that moment was considered a part of did not love the light because he could not see the light. He loved his own zeal and religious and piety and everything. And I believe Nicodemus was probably the most humble of the Pharisees. The most loving. The most concerned with truth. But he still was not born of God. He, didn't, he never hated Jesus in the context of how Jesus fought against the status quo of his own religion. He, he was consciously aware that Jesus came from God. But yet he could not see until he was born of God. So that's what the world means. So in the world of unbelievers, in the world of religious people, you will have tribulation. When has the church of Jesus Christ had the greatest tribulation and from whom? I mean, when has there ever been in history the alliance of angry atheists? That's the new AAA, by the way. $50 a year. 
When has there ever been an alliance of angry atheists who have risen up against the church of Jesus and persecuted her to the ends of the age? Never. When's the last time you saw the bad boy Buddhists coming in to take over the church? You see those religious zealots with a false gospel, with a false God, using the Bible as their God who hate the church. Now, I know I can't speak holistically and exhaustively there in that little tiny dogmatic statement and all of the historians of the world are going, oh, you're wrong. I've got 14 off the top of my head. Well, that's fine. It's for emphasis. Not to be taken down. Well, wow, there's never been ever any ever, 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 ever. You know, just it's for emphasis. That's what oratory does. It has things you employ for emphasis. I find it silly that I have to say that, but I do. The tribulation comes mostly from those who claim to be God's people, who claim to be in the faith, who claim to be Christ people, who claim to be followers of Christ, even in the midst of our own soteriological circles. You may find Calvinistic people who hate the gospel because they want their own gospel to appease their own flesh, to hold something over the churches that they govern, not willfully, not with joy, but with an iron fist. And they talk to all these front row Christians, you know, we've got a lot of them. These front row Christians, and it's just, they point to them. You sit on the front row, you think you're special. That's why I chose that row. Nobody's there. You think you're special? You think you're really in love with the Lord? Sitting on the front row doesn't make you right. You're probably not even good enough. When just a year before they saw their sin and God converted them, and they saw the gospel and God converted them, and that's why they saw these things. I mean, it's not cause and effect here. I'm just throwing out things I want to say. And, I mean, they've been born of God. And they know they're sinner. They know that Christ satisfied God's wrath for them. They know that they are the elect of God, the chosen. And they trust fully in the finished work of Jesus, even in their greatest of days and their awesome opportunities of obedience. When they're walking in a manner worthy of the calling of Christ, they hope in the Lord Jesus. And then all of a sudden, because there's something in their life that the man up there says it isn't quite good enough. Now they're lost, you see. And that's what a false gospel looks like, y'all. You're not quite good enough. Praise be to God. Measure this year <laughs> as to how your spiritual life truly ended up. On a scale from 1 to 10, how close is your hope in your own flesh? Are you an 8? Are you a 7? You know, got that low D on the grading scale. It's a pass, but it's a D as in, dull. Oh, I almost lost. Well, guess what? D's don't get into heaven. Neither do C's, neither do B's, neither do A's. There is no A grade. If you make 100% in your behavior you cannot have eternal life the only thing the only way the only one who can give you eternal life is jesus and his obedience and his perfection and his righteousness and his atoning work on the cross the world will cause you pain this life will be painful so let's stop looking church for the day when God's going to give us 10 years of reprieve. And let's start looking at what is promised to us in this. In me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But here's the problem. In my flesh, in my logic, and in my ability to deal with things, even if it's better than it used to be, or worse than it used to be, or better than somebody else, or worse than someone else, no matter how it is, as long as I'm looking at the tribulation that comes from the world, I'm not looking at Christ. 
I'm not looking at Christ. And I'm always thinking, okay, Jesus, you're my peace. Take away this world. And we live in a, we live in a depressed state of wondering when it's going to get better. It's not. The world is never going to be better for the Christian. What is better is that which is best and perfect, who is Jesus Christ. Jesus was going to the Father. He was in the mind of His disciples abandoning them. But He says, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. God the Spirit is with you. And you will do greater things because now you will see the truth. He will teach you the truth. We see that in John 17. We understand that clearly. So I'm not just asserting this stuff. It's here. You will have tribulation. But even then, sometimes we think, well, we've got to overcome this. We just get past this. We've got to deal with this. We've got to... We're not going to. How do we overcome this? And here's the truth. We don't. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Let me... Let me just rant for a minute and put it in perspective for you. Yes, Jesus is saying here, all of your guilt before the Father, all of the fallenness of your being, all of the sin in your life and in your mind now and forever, I have destroyed. I've overcome it. That's the world overcome there. I have destroyed and am victorious. That's what it means. I am victorious over this. I have conquered this. There is no guilt for you, even though you're going to run for your lives and deny me before men, I will bring you back to me. And you will believe. And you will confess me before men. And just as those who say in the name of God, I put you to death. Remember that? Over in chapter 16, chapter 15. I've overcome them too. Paul, when he teaches to the Corinthians in that second or third letter, as we call it 2 Corinthians, when he teaches to them and he says... We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the insurpassing power belongs to God. Chapter 4, verse 7 of 2 Corinthians. To God and not to us, we are afflicted in every way. Listen to what the world gave Paul. We're afflicted in every way, but what Christ is in peace, but we are not crushed. The world, we are perplexed, but in Christ we are not driven to, to despair. In the world we are persecuted, but in Christ we are not forsaken. In the world we're struck down, but in Christ we're not destroyed. In the world we're always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. And that's an important reality. So that in Christ the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are being given over to death for the sake of Christ, so that the life of Christ may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. But this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, the world, but to the things that are unseen, the Christ. For the things that are seen are passing away, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And I mean, I could go, I could go to every letter Paul wrote. And I could show it to you. I could go to Peter's, both of his letters. I could go to all three of John's letters. I can show you this in every New Testament teaching. I've overcome the world. You're not guilty before the Father because I overcame sin. The world and its ruler will be cast out, John 12, 31. The sting of death is no more for I put it in me. 1 Corinthians 15, the sting of sin and death and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 John, that portion there before, do not love the world, in chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, 
I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I'm writing to you children because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. He just repeats himself. And I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Jesus has overcome the world, even its religious paganism that persecutes us greatly as the church, as the gathered ones. See, I hate the word, but it's the word, you know? What do you, what do, you do with that word? I want to change it. He's overcome the world. That means... All the suffering of the world, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, I just read, is light momentary affliction preparing us for an eternal heaviness, weighty, grave, grave weight of glory beyond comparison. So that the pressures of this world and the suffering of this world, even in its darkest pain, as heavy as it feels, is nothing. Put on the glory of Christ and see how heavy that is. It's like weighing the waters of the sea against the feather of a chicken. And the feather of the chicken is the suffering of life and the world. And the weight of the waters of the sea is the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And the beautiful picture there, when I use that image, I hate the sea. And I hate the ocean. I hate water. I'm fearful of drowning in water. And I can swim very well. It's just a phobia. I'm not one of these guys that go on cruises. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Free food. Who cares? I'm going to die. But when I think about the weightiness of the glory of Christ drowning me in his joy and peace, I want to take a breath so deep that I can't stop sucking in air. I've overcome the world. That means that all of the suffering all of the religious persecution, all of our so-called brothers and sisters in the faith who hate us and malign us and destroy us, it's all just a tiny little waste of nothing. Nobody wants a hangnail, but just clip it off. That's how we should look at it. And that's the peace that is Christ. There's not an argument there's not death. There's nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. So we rejoice even when we're not able to express it. We hold fast in the midst of all this life as we tarry, as we work, as we labor. It is hard, beloved. And I feel and I see people throughout life when, when tribulation comes and when stress comes and when life happens. It's easy for them to walk away from the faith. Because there is some imbalance. Though the righteous and the unrighteous both have calamity, there seems to be an overwhelming sense of unbalanced calamity for the believers. Because as long as we're walking in the way of the world, in the world's religion, in pagan Christianity, people leave us alone. You ever been the odd person out at a dinner party and things got a little off? You're thinking, I think they've had a little too much wine. But you don't drink. <laughs> it's an odd place. They're laughing about stuff you didn't get the joke. You ever been somewhere in public at a restaurant and a fight breaks out and you don't know what's happening? Then all of a sudden people see you looking at it and they think you're part of it. You ever been in a relationship where you're minding your own business and you're just trying to grow in the faith and somebody in your own household comes against you? Somebody in your own family comes against you? It happens. It's strange. But yet if we join in with them, we're friends. 
If we put down our Bibles, we're friends. If we give up this gospel, we're friends. If we just talk about the love of God for every single person in the world, then we're friends. Everybody loves us. Everybody's a Christian. If you don't believe me, ask them. But few are. Few have been born of God. Few see that tribulation is theirs to bear. Now, what do we do with that? The so what? Here we go in the last few seconds. Paul tells Timothy to endure the tribulation that he faces by the grace which is his in Jesus Christ. That means that when we see suffering and we whine and complain about it, we're not rejoicing in the promise of God. For if Christ suffered, and if Christ was hated, and if Christ was persecuted, and if the world came against Christ, how much more so are we, what, what else are we supposed to expect if we are in Him? If we are His body, and they hate Him, they will surely hate Him. I've never seen anyone arrest an arm. Well, your left arm stole that cash at the Dairy Queen. We're going to put it in jail. And that would be it. My legs are gone. Let's call see if they're locked up. I've never seen any, you know, anybody's finger trigger go to prison for murder. Well, that trigger finger, boy. No, you are indicted and persecuted, and you get it. You get sick, you're sick. You go, that's it. If we are the body of Christ, what Christ has suffered, we, should, we shall also suffer. But here's the beauty of it. If we are in Christ... This promise is ours. Let us look at our suffering as preparation, preparation for an eternal weight of glory because Christ is going to be exalted above all names and every tongue on the earth and every tongue in heaven and under the earth is going to say that Jesus is Lord. He will be glorified. And if we are suffering as His body, we also shall share in His glory. That's how we look at persecution. That's how we look at this promise. That's how we look at tribulation. And the only way we're going to maintain that, back to the beginning, is to together have the discipline and the training, not of what the culture has taught us to do, but what the Word of God and each other encourage us to do. That's the point. And that's what you need to see from here. And the most beautiful thing is that not only did Jesus declare these things as so as God, He then prayed to the Father to secure them for us. And that's what chapter 17 is all about that the security of the promises of Christ are guaranteed. They're guaranteed, beloved. So in that alone, you can rejoice. Let's pray.